Welcome, Dr. Brian Hemmings. Thank you for joining Education City podcast. Um, Brian is a sports and exercise psychologist and uh, has been the, or was the lead um, psychologist for the England golf team uh, 1997 to 2013 and helped develop the mental strengths of, of many of the players and, and some then went on to become major champions like Danny Willett and others top 10 in the world, Tommy Fleetwood and uh, Eddie Pepperell, who we know well here in Qatar, having won the Qatar Masters um, a couple of years back. Author of four, four books on the subject matter, mental toughness, uh, the minds of winning, but also worked with Olympic athletes as well, um, uh, Olympic uh, winning athletes. Uh, so fully uh, rounded on, on the, the subject matter of sports psychology. And I think really my opening question for you, uh, Brian is um, a lot of people are surprised to hear that top golfers and other sports stars uh, need the advice of sports uh, psychologists. And really, can you tell me the sort of things that you work on with these with these great athletes? Uh, well, each individual is different. Some of the times, things uh, it can be uh, things off course that are affecting them on course, or it can be um, I. I just immediately what comes to mind is um, I have something called a performance loop, a model, and it's basically um, uh, it's set into three segments of uh, before, during and after. And I guess with um, uh, bef before performance, you're talking about things like how do people practice, how do people prepare psychologically for uh, the performance that's ahead of them. And that obviously influences uh, what you do during performance. Then you've got during performance strategies, let's say for things like uh, dealing, uh, dealing with pressure, uh, staying in the present, dealing with mistakes, dealing with distractions. Uh, and then you've got after for performance, which often people forget is, is how, how does somebody go about evaluating what they've done in terms of um, perhaps uh, dealing with disappointments, dealing with frustrations or dealing with success and in terms of how that then informs uh, what they need to do next in terms of uh, before again. So it's kind of before, during, after and a loop. So someone's constantly thinking about before, during and it's, so it's performance planning and evaluating. Okay, yeah, it's interesting to, so how, how do you get to that stage of a conversation with with a player? Because when we get to a tournament, and we had the Qatar Masters here um, three months ago, and you look down the range, and they're all hitting the ball in the range, and it, technically they're all very, very similar. Um, but that's not the case. When it gets out in the golf courses, the, the scores are, are dramatically different. You've got some guys shooting in the low 60s and some guys shooting in the 80s, and you think, wow, yeah, on the range it looks so similar. So um, how do you get into these conversations? Because like you say, it's 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 all all about the personality and each and every person has their own own needs. So, what sort of analysis do you do you go through with the player um, to to identify how they can uh, prepare themselves or, or become stronger mentally? Well, I think relationships with each individual are very are very different. People present with very different different needs. That changes across uh, changes across tournaments, across their careers. Uh, I guess the f the first thing is is how do people end up working with uh, with a, a sports like like myself is sometimes it's a, a sense themselves that there's a problem or a challenge that they don't feel that they're managing particularly well perhaps uh, you know it, it can change I was just thinking it can change quite rapidly you can get one player who thrives on being under pressure and you can, you can meet another player is is uh, pressure really gets to them. So, so then you can get a player who, when there's kind of no pressure there, early early start parts of tournaments, they fight, they struggle to, they struggle to get the best out of themselves, uh, and you can get another individual and they prefer that that situation. So there's never a a kind of a standard case, but generally I think people come for two reasons. It's one is there's a there's a a particular challenge they're facing or a problem that they think is impeding them impeding their success uh, or making them underperform. And then often you'll get players who who just feel very open to change. And um, am I missing anything? Or what can we do that might develop develop my game? So 
typically that means um, just sitting down with a player, uh, having a conversation. I, I call it having a conversation with a purpose. So we'd just be chatting and trying to get a, a, a handle on how they approach the game, how they think about the game, what they think is important, um, what areas of, of strength do they think they have, um, areas of limitation, and then trying to work out how much of that is psychological. It may not be psychological. I mean, I, 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 was, I was just thinking before we, was, we were speaking is the amount of players I sit down and actually say, you know what, you need to work with your coach on this. Because it's um, there's a limitation and actually it turns out the limitation perhaps isn't as psychological as they thought. Maybe it's a more of a technical issue or it's astounding actually how much of it comes down to practice and that, uh, that, that their practice doesn't simulate the game demands enough and therefore they don't put themselves under pressure in practice and and so therefore when they get in tournament situations it's it's not as it's not as dependable as they'd like it to be so i often spend a lot of time talking with players about um the context of their practice and and positive transfer to the tournament environment because often and i'm sure you'll know this through many years of your coaching career michael is that uh, practice is often very much based on a repetitive uh, you know repetitive movements repetitive swings on driving ranges uh, or short game areas you'll get people with lots of balls and just practicing uh, and, and holding technique but of course, in the game, we know that we only get one chance at it. And so it's, in, it's, it's helping players put themselves in situations where it is more of a more of a, a, a one ball, a one ball approach. Remember many years ago, you were saying about England golf. Uh, we used to call it one ball practice. So players would go out would say about how they were going to separate their day and how much of their day was going to be one ball practice. So you'd see people at, at, at Whittle Spa, which was the National Golf Centre. Uh, you'd see players go around uh, short game areas, tremendous short game area there with a bucket of balls and just dropping balls in different places to more replicate game situations rather than just standing there hitting. It's not that there's no, there's no place for that, but it was... Um, it was to make them see that psychologically that's a completely different task when you've only got one ball in front of you, which which greater simulates what you do on the golf course. And that's where true confidence comes from. Man, that's a great point. I think uh, the, the great Davis Love, he used to only ever practice his putting with one ball for that very purpose, that and you're never going to get three rolls at every every part of the golf course. So a one ball practice is, is great. And the same as honing in on the driving range. The driving ranges will be the widest fairway you're ever going to practice on. So you may think you're hitting the fairway, but you're not. So uh, honing that in is a great advice. Um, players like Tommy Fleetwood, who you'd know from his, his junior days, um, he, and he's had a tremendous turnaround in his career in the last uh, four or five years from uh, the stories go that he was about to give the game up. Um, he was struggling so, so badly. Um, were you part of that uh, turnaround or are you, are you aware of what happened to him where he... Yeah, I mean, I'm aware. I'm aware professionally of, of, of difficulties. I think I was really privileged to work with so many great players in that period. Um, particularly after 2000, there was lottery funding came in the UK, and um, the co national coaching setup changed hugely in terms of the finance available. And then players were able to. I mean, essentially, they were amateurs traveling around the world, practice and playing. There was professionals in every sense, except they weren't getting paid um uh and and tommy obviously was one of those ones who i've met i think i met tommy when he was probably about 13 uh he was on a northwest regional boys squad um always always super talented always hit the ball really far um uh, uh, Travelled with him to uh, European boys tournaments um, and European men's tournaments, European youth tournaments, and I think, like many players, sometimes is that is that when they turn professional, they can feel that 
there needs to be a step up and they need to change things. And, uh, and um, of course, you, I think you're still realizing you need to develop, but sometimes development doesn't come from making changes. Development comes from merely experiencing things and adapting. So as you play on different type courses or different fields or in different countries, you accrue experience and experience helps you develop. So you don't have to make technical changes, so on. I think I think um, in Tommy's case, he 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 changed his coach, and as you know, things uh, golf is very much a game of confidence. And if you if you start hitting the ball poorly, you can nosedive in your confidence pretty quickly, and um, and particularly when you're under pressure and you feel that you're trying to uh retain a card then i i think he he hit difficulties um and i think he got he, he, i mean he's he's talked he's talked um publicly about that he felt he almost had the yips with his swing um and i think he he decided to have a complete rethink and went back to his uh boyhood coach alan um uh he went back to his old boyhood coach Alan Thompson in the Northwest, who he'd known since he was a you know a young boy. And Alan, who I know very very well, very quickly and methodically kind of pinpointed um, where it, where he felt the issues were. And I think I think going back to somebody he knew and trusted from from his junior days, I think really really helped him. And 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 then I guess you hit momentum and 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 uh, he was away. But I, I would have. Um, I remember a, a car journey with Alan many, many years ago. I think we were a tournament in the Northwest. It might have been at Formby. And he said, Yo, I think we were talking about young players coming through. And, he, and we were just comparing. And obviously, I'm not a technical person, so I couldn't be really making a judgment on people's technical skills. But more psychologically, who did I think was well equipped for that? And I remember saying, I remember saying Tommy because he was always from a very young age, always very, very balanced individual, always um, good perspective on things, quite easygoing. I felt he was quite low, what I'd call low maintenance. He didn't kind of change from low to high, low to, and you can, I guess you can see that in his his demeanour and how he mm. carries himself. But um, I'm, I'm, it's really good to see him doing so well because he's a. a uh, a, a terrific guy. I haven't spoken to him for some time, but um, we used to have games of football at uh, Woodall Spa as a, uh, at the end of the day, I think, or in the mornings as part of a, a warm-up for the day before breakfast. And uh, Tommy was an Everton supporter. I was a Chelsea supporter. And we used to we used to be a front two. Um, and, uh, yeah, fully... Uh, uh, it, a great character and pleased to see him doing so well. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? So the, the same swing, uh, the same person, yet just a, a minor change, a little bit of confidence, and then the momentum uh, get, gets with you. And you must have seen, so obviously there's a lot of technically gifted players uh, that come through and, and don't quite make it. And then there's others that are maybe not quite so gifted who do make it. And I would say, uh, to be fair, Ian Poulter is probably one of those players that um, wasn't blessed with the, the the length of drives that say um, uh, Rory McIlroy uh, was given and such like. But there's a, a young professional that came through uh, the ranks, really came right the way through as a true pro, working in the golf shop in the pro shops, and then worked his way right the way through. But his self belief is just phenomenal. Um, is that something that can be taught, or is that something that uh, he was he was um, brought up with? Yeah, I think it's a it's that kind of nature nurture debate. I think it's a probably I, I don't know Ian, but um, I, I know of kind of players of that ilk that you talk. I think it's a bit of both. I think I think they're probably wired a little bit that way, but probably early influences uh, in terms of a very positive approach, a bit a, a kind of a can do, and very resilient in terms of um, um manage manage setbacks very 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 well and and uh there's a there's a kind of um in, in psychology there's a there's a view about whether you approach situations do you see them as a challenge or a threat uh 
and I would imagine someone like Ian is constantly seeing things as a challenge rather than as a threat. And I think, so I would think some of that is learned from people around him. Uh, I I know um, um, from reading interviews that Ian's never felt the need to uh, work with a psychologist. I think sometimes he misunderstands what working with a psychologist would look like, um, but probably doesn't probably doesn't need that himself anyway. But uh, I would imagine he's he's um, uh, a strong personality. He's always seeing things as challenges, no matter what the situation sees them as a challenge. Um, so I would imagine some of that is a bit hardwired in his personality. But then otherwise, maybe his early learning experiences, maybe his parents, his family, people around him have made a very much uh, uh, reinforced that reinforced that approach. And like you say, I think he's the sort of person who's who's going to squeeze every ounce out of his, he won't look back at his career and think I didn't make the most of myself. He'll probably look back and probably as somebody who overachieved. And of course, like you, you say, there's other people who I can think back, I won't name them because that would be unfair, but you can think back of players who were in, who were quite highly thought of technically wise, but would, would have, have, have underachieved. And um, I think sometimes it's, you know, timing, players come through on tour and um, not quite in form or lose a bit of form, let's say lose a bit of momentum. And before you know it, they're, 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 they're having real difficulty um, and uh, very hard to get it back because uh, you, they can be under fine. I, I've worked with players and um, great amateurs and then they start playing and there's money around and, and just can't get their head around playing for money. As a, this, it's almost too much. Yeah, no, I think you're, yeah. you're right with uh, Walter. It looks like he gets the best out of everything. And, and um, that's, a, that's a great way of looking at it, that he sees every piece of adversity as a challenge rather than, than, a, than a threat. Um, at, the, at the recreational level, which we're at, we're at the golf club and we have um, what you call weekend golfers or people who are playing the game for fun, we're obviously encouraging them to take regular lessons uh, and then to the next level, we're saying you should stretch before you play. And if you want to make some improvements to your swing, you should go to the gym. Um, but the the mental aspect is um, as important, but it's rarely talked about at a, a sort of a club golfer level. Um, what what do you think we could give uh, advice? To the, the recreational player to just get a little bit more out the um, out of the mental aspect of the game. Often you hear people talking about positive talk and such like, but that can often be false talk because they haven't got the maybe the technical ability to to, to back it up. But um, how would you how would you go about preparing someone, irrespective of their uh, technical ability, to get the best out of their performance uh, week in week out when they're when they're playing their their, their passion, their, 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 their weekly monthly medal, for example. Hmm. I guess a couple of things come to mind is is um, is the is working out why they're playing is and, and this they might be doing Hello. both, but working out working out are they playing for are they playing for in, in, in enjoyment and fun as a pastime or are they really keen on their performance? And if they're really keen on their performance, then it would be kind of setting some goals around their performance and then trying to work out, well, what is it that's going to improve, what is this going to improve my chance of uh, reaching those goals? So I'd say you often meet recreational golfers. I've worked with some, you know, uh, uh, golfers and say, if it's really just purely about in- enjoyment and you're not going to practice anymore, then we've got to look at things either just before performance or just after it, which is going to maybe mod- help you modify your thinking in some of the situations on the course, whether it's about dealing with mistakes or uh, uh, trying to kind of stay in the moment. So it's 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 trying to help each player work out, you know, what is it they're trying to do with their game? Is it about Im- improving? and performing or is it merely about an enjoyment and if it's merely just about enjoyment is 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 what could make the game more fun for them 
and that might help asking those sorts of questions might help identify some of the things they may need to do to enhance enjoyment or or enhance performance so some 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 players i work with and they'll say okay yeah i'm prepared to do a couple more hours on the range because they realize that actually or, or go and work with the coach a little bit more because actually that's where my performance or my enjoyment will is likely to come from but um typically would be i would say it's about um sitting down setting some goals with somebody as a coach and and working as a collaboration in terms of okay how can i enhance my enjoyment or how can i enhance my performance and getting a conversation going uh, uh, i guess the, 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 i'm just trying to think of simple techniques in terms of maybe perhaps if, if uh, a breathe uh, in helping them breathe on a golf course you know it's 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 a uh, it's really hard to give a, a definitive answer to that, Michael, because I'm, I'm sure it's like with coaching is um, every individual is so different and presents with such different concerns. You might get some player who, who's absolutely great, but just that first tee or, or first tee nerves might be the thing that really makes a difference for them. It might be in terms of uh, who uh, playing partners and, and do they feel a little bit unnerved when there or when there's people watching or if there's um, people coming up behind them and they feel um, and maybe uh, people want to play through them and they feel pressured being uh, when um, uh, when groups are tightly packed on the course. So I, 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 I think it's having a conversation with each player with their with their coach and saying, OK, I can see um, what's the primary reason you play is it is it because you're trying to improve what you do and, and perform and lower your handicap or is it merely just about enjoyment and then how can we how can we as coaches facilitate that a bit of a rambling answer that but um um i, I guess what i'm trying to do is express the the, the challenges of, of of an individual everyone thinks differently everyone it's the same game it's the same uh it's the same aim in terms of getting the ball in the hole with fewer strokes but everyone everyone's built differently and, and approaches goal differently and and in my experience it's found by you only find the best answers by spending time with people and finding out what's important to them That, that, make, that makes sense, yes, and that's a great way of breaking it down into two categories. Yeah, that, um, some people uh, just are going out there to have fun, get some exercise, but they still want to do well and, and uh, perform to their best, and others are wanting to take their game to the next level, win the club championship, play uh, for, their, for, their, for their club or their county or, or, or nationally and such like, and then that needs to take a bit more of a focused approach with the, the coach. But uh, absolutely, everyone is, is different. Um, you see, um, golf is a, a, a long drawn out sport. We're on the golf course for a good number of hours. Um, keeping keeping focused is often a, a big a big term. And I would I would certainly myself and my own experience to say that trying to stay focused for four hours is near impossible. Uh, and in this modern age, uh, we seem to be less and less focused just with the, the way we use technology now. Any tips for for golfers on um, getting into a more focused state of mind and then being there uh, throughout the round so that they, again, are getting the best out of, of the golf during a during an 18-hole round? Yeah, well, I think yeah. if it, it, you only have to look at the professional game. and uh, Clearly, you want play to be moving quite swiftly. But typically, we'd be having some sort of routine. Is you, you know, there's a number of distractions on the golf course. Clearly, um, when you get over the ball, you need to have your attention focused in on particular things. Uh, and so a, a psychologist would view attention on a kind of a continuum to broad to narrow. So when you're viewing a, uh, a let's say you had a, a, a shot into a green, you've got a, a broad focus as you approach the ball because you're taking into account maybe perhaps the wind, uh, the, the, the distance. Um, and then you want to, and then, and then making your decision about which club and what you're going to try and do with the ball and then you narrow your attention into walking into the ball and so on getting over the ball and and, and having an execution phase 
So it would be, I, I, would, I would think we've um, uh, recreational um, golfers, my experience is that they, if you ask them about, they say, you just say, do you have a routine before you're shot? They might say no, but actually when you quiz them, they actually say, well, yeah, you know, I, I do X, Y, and Z. And what you're trying to do is get them to do X, Y, Z um, in, a, in, a, in, a repetitive, in a repetitive, planned, deliberate fashion. So in other words, there's lots of distractions on a golf course. You, can, you might be talking with your playing partners, but when you're over the ball, you, you, you want to be absolutely focused on the task. And each, uh, each individual has a different focus over the ball. Um, there's been a, there's been a little bit of stuff on over the years on what's called gaze behaviour, you know. So in other words, where the uh, it's been done a lot of work on on, on putting, um, but where do where do people look, or where do they where do they fix their gaze um, prior to um, ball contact and for how long? And I've done a lot of work with players on on. Uh, on putting but also on on driving and approach plays about where they fixate their gaze prior to executing their shot so they're focused on their eyes are focused on the on particular parts of the environment in terms of i'm focused on the t I'm, I'm absolutely focused on the task now if my if my eyes are gazing at this point that means my attention is where i want it to be it doesn't guarantee you always hit a brilliant shot but it, it guarantees that that you're, you're focused on that point at, at hand. So my advice would be, yeah, there's lots of, you're out on the golf course for a long time, um, lots of distractions. Some of the distractions you want, because if you're having fun, you want to be talking to your friends and uh, chatting about stuff. But if, if, you, if you want to get uh, the, the sort of cliched focused on each shot as it comes, then Inevitably, there has to be some sort of um, pre-shot routine. It doesn't have to be really elaborate, but there's there's some sort of um, sequence of thoughts and behaviours that gets you in the right position to execute uh, your skills, whatever your skills are. Excellent. No, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So just to, just to sort of a, a wrap up and see if I can get get all this right. But I think. Um, Again, from a club golfer, the, the, the practice of the warm up needs to have uh, a little bit more purpose and, and, and be more realistic uh, to a round of golf. Uh, I think the one ball analogy is, is great. I think that makes a, a lot of sense um, trying to um, hit the driving range or hit imaginary uh, target greens and such, such like. And then the next key one is just building up a routine to, to make sure you get that repetitiveness in there and get your thoughts in order before before uh, heading out on the golf course, it makes a lot of sense. And then if you're a more serious golfer, chat with your coach, um, work out your goals. And, and then it's, would that be right to say that then you're going to start to be able to segment your game into different areas and then you'll find out from there where you want to put the effort in to make the, the necessary improvements? Yeah, I, 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 would, I, I supervise this other lad who's working with a, a recreational golfer and he said, uh, this is just last week. He said, "I'm sitting down with him, and he said he just wants to be more consistent in his game." And I said, "Well, look, consistency is such a vague thing. You've got to work out which parts of your game lack consistency or have more variation than you than you think is 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 where it's affecting your scoring. So you've got to go from vague to quite specific." So I think the, the advantage of working with a coach is sitting with a player and saying, OK, let's work on specifics. And and then in practice, there's got to be obviously you can you can have scoring statistics, but in practice, there has to be some objectivity to that in terms of uh, setting up practices where the golfer receives some feedback about how good a shot is that whether it's pretty in short game, whether it's distance from the flag and averages or, or uh, um, uh, in terms of uh, a fairway, an imaginary fairway or marked fairways and how many times they hit that fairway there. There has to be a go from broad, uh, broad to specific and have some measurability or objectivity. And I, I think that's done in collaboration with a coach. 
so we can we can highlight one particular area and say okay how can we focus on this is there any technical work to be done and then as you go away and practice because it will be practice the thing that makes it makes the difference is can i set up some some practice activities where it's more of a one ball focus where I can get some feedback on am I improving because that's where the confidence will come from is 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 highly highly um highly focused practice which has good has positive transfer to the course so yeah I'd say that the, the 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 more serious players it's um it's good collaboration with a coach really drilling down into specific areas and then taking that into highly focused practice situations Brilliant. No, that's super. Th thank you. Uh, thank you for your time, uh, Brian. That's been fascinating insight into into the mind of golf and um, what uh, all golfers really need to do to, to just get up to the next level of performance. So appreciate your time and um, um, look forward to speaking to you again sometime. Thank you. Thank you.